Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Jason Coleman. I'm a clinical application scientist with Precision Nanosystems, and I'm representing the North American East. And I'm very excited today uh, to, number one, be a part of this Tea Time webinar series, but the most excited and, and honored to get to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Michael Bushman. Uh, he's coming to you from George Mason University here in the United States uh, as well. He's going to be talking to you today about molecular and colloidal ionization properties of lipid nanoparticles and mRNA vaccines. Uh, so just to start, I kind of want, want to introduce to you your uh, regional support teams. Uh, so that includes your, your European team, uh, which is AJ John, Jurgen Schmidt, Richard Broadband, and Martin Rebel. And as well as, you know, since we're, um, you know, taking part of these tea time series here in the, in the U.S., this includes, you know, myself and your North American East team, which is Sri Kakamanu, Rahul Chid, uh, myself, Jason Coleman, and Pratik Goswami. So just to give a, a bio here about with uh, Dr. Bushman, uh, Michael Bushman is the chair of bioengineering at George Mason University since 2017. He was previously a professor at biomedical engineering and chemical engineering at Polytechnique de Montreal from 1994 to 2017 where his biomaterials research resulted in successful clinical translation of a cartilage repair product and new nanovectors for the delivery of nucleic acids. He is currently focusing on ionizable lipids to deliver messenger RNA for vaccines. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you. I look forward to your talk today. Okay, great. Well, that, yeah, thanks so much, Jason. It's an honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, so, here, uh, we'll start off just showing a little kind of uh, paradigm schematic of what a lipid nanoparticle uh, looks like. And the current model is shown here on the left, where the pegylated lipid is on the outside uh, in contact with the aqueous phase. And then there's typically a bilayer structure that's thought to contain most of the helper lipid, the DSPC as well. And then inside, you have uh, the protonated ionizable lipid that's electrostatically bound to the negative phosphate backbone of the mRNA. There may be a few copies of mRNA between maybe one and five uh, versus several hundred copies, for example, of silencing RNA, a much smaller molecule. And this central region is typically electron dense in a cryo EM image and also contains the bulk of the cholesterol. So the way they're produced is uh, in a microfluidic setting or a T-junction setting, there are the four lipids in ethanol. And here I'm showing the four, the ionizable. I have two symbols for the protonated form as well as the neutral form. But the four lipids in ethanol mix with a low pH aqueous solution of mRNA and particles form come out the other side. And I use the Spark system from PNI, and the advantage of Spark is the very small volume. So there's a little well here that's 16 microliters typically of the lipids, 32 of mRNA, and then ejected typically into a PBS solution of 48. So the advantage is you can do a lot of formulations and not consume a lot of material. So what happens during the mixing, uh, this was uh, indicated recently by a uh, publication by Dr. Kulkarni from Peter Kulis's group, and we've found similar features as well, is that the lipids in ethanol, since there's no counter ions, uh, they're, uh, the ionizable lipid is neutral. But when it contacts the low pH buffer, typically pH 4 acetic acid, uh, it will become protonated and then it electrostatically binds to the backbone of the phosphate. And at the same time, the solvent is predominantly water now. And so the lipids become insoluble and form uh, these vesicles. And what you'll see in this sort of intermediate mixing stage is a heterogeneous population. This was published by Kulkarni, but we found this as well in this image where there are mRNA containing particles. And then there's these liposomes that are sort of empty as well. And there's a lot of those and they're typically smaller. Um, when you eject that solution into the PBS, the ionizable lipid acts as its own buffer. Of course, it pulls up the pH during mixing to about five and a half, and then in PBS it becomes six and a half. And as you neutralize up through diafiltration and dialysis, you're gradually neutralizing and removing the proton from the ionizable lipid. And that forces this fusion process because then it becomes more hydrophobic and uh, the vesicles fuse. And eventually you get these sort of typical homogeneous vesicles shown here with the bilayer structure that is represented in this schematic. So it's driven by 
polarity and, and electrostatic forces, this assembly process. Now, when cells take up the lipid nanoparticle, it has to go back in the other direction. So they'll take up predominantly uh, neutral, not protonated ionizable lipid. In this state, actually, the LNP is slightly negative because of the charge and the mRNA is dominant. And there's just a little bit of protonated ionized lipid. So it's, it's really a negative LNP that's taken up. But as the pH drops in the endosome, you go past what is known to be the pKa of the LNP, which is typically around six and a half. And then you start to protonate that ionizable lipid again, and then it will find an endogenous phospholipid that's negative, forms this ion pair. And this is typically shown as a cone-shaped structure. The more cone-shaped it is actually, the less it's compatible with the bilayer and the more it will open that endosomal membrane, allow the mRNA to come out and then be translated into the protein product. So it's generally thought that you need at minimum two features of an ionizable lipid in order to have effective endosomal release, which is one of the main barriers. First one being a pKa from six to seven that was shown a long time ago in this publication with silencing RNA, a very strong maximum in silencing around a LNT pKa of six and a half, 6.4. And the other one that's become more apparent is the shape of the tail should be cone shaped. So the early article by Hayes show that the more you add double bonds, the more you get a cone-shaped kind of tail and the more it's uh, endosomally released. And then that sort of progresses down here to the modern ones that are in the current vaccines where the branching gives a fairly evident uh, morphologically uh, cone-shaped ionizable lipid. So the ionization controls uh, endosomal release, but it also controls biodistribution. This was shown by Krantz in 2016 where an excess of the cationic uh, lipid versus the mRNA payload makes a positive particle that intravascular goes to lung, shown here. And then when you have uh, uh, an excess of the anionic mRNA, then it becomes negative and it goes to spleen, as shown here. And this was uh, seen again by uh, Dan Siegward's group, where they used uh, the traditional MC3 or his own dendromer formulation and then they added a cationic and anionic or no additional lipid and drove through a charge mediated process, a lung distribution, spleen distribution, or when you don't add anything, it naturally goes to liver. And that, that targeting to liver um, has been known since 2010 in this article that it's mediated by APOE binding to the surface of the LNP. Sometimes it's not emphasized that this is actually charge dependent as well, um, because it was shown in this article in 2010 that if you use a cationic uh, ionizable lipid, permanently cationic, the binding doesn't occur and the targeting to hepatocytes doesn't occur either. And then in earlier publications, it's actually shown that if you have a highly negative um, lipid, then that binding also doesn't occur. So the APOE requires sort of a slightly negative LNP for charge mediated binding and then hepatocyte targeting. So what we asked in this study were whether we could predict the pKa of the LNP from the structure of the lipid and whether the pKa um, uh, behaves in an intramuscular site similar to hepatocyte for endosomal release, if it should be around six and a half for the LNP. And then we also asked whether there was a charge mediated biodistribution in intramuscular delivery like there is and everyone knows in intravascular delivery. Um, so to uh, address these, we picked five commercially available ionizable lipids shown here, MC3 and its precursors, more or less. And with these TNS pKa values that range from 5.8 all the way up to 7. And then we characterized the molecular pKa of the lipid, which is different from the LNP pKa. And then we did the LNP by TNS and by zeta potential electrophoretic mobility with the cryo-10 and then transaction efficiency in vitro and in vivo. So the first thing we notice, and this is the work of my postdoc, Dr. Alashetti, and an undergraduate student, Huda Saeed. Uh, first thing we noticed is in programs such as ACD labs, if you calculate the pK of the ionizable lipid, they're always about maybe two to three points higher than the measured TNS pK. So we found this kind of curious, and we wanted to answer the question of why is that the case, that the aqueous phase pK seems to be a couple of points higher than the TNS pK. So first thing we did is we said, we wanna make sure that this prediction, theoretical prediction is correct. So the way we did that is use NMR to measure pKa. And the way this works is if you have a molecule here, trimethylamine as an example, if you have a protonatable species in the absence of the binding of the proton, you have this electron pair 
that is in proximity to the methyl protons that you're seeing the chemical shift of here. And these electrons will shield, electronically shield those protons and create this chemical shift. Then when the proton binds, um, you draw those electrons away and you deshield these methyl protons and then the chemical shift moves downfield from deshielding. The trick here is you actually don't see two distinct lines because proton exchange is very fast compared to NMR experiment times. You see a mole fraction weighted position of a single chemical shift rather than two distinct lines. And that's shown here for an NMR pH indicator that we use, imidazole. And in the unprotonated state, we're monitoring the chemical shift of this proton here. In the unprotonated state, it is deshielded and then, uh, sorry, shielded. And then when you protonate it, um, this, this proton comes in, pulls those electrons away and deshields that proton and moves the chemical shift downfield. So this is actually a henderson hasselbalch titration curve shown here. And if you fit that to henderson hasselbalch you can extract the pKa of the midazole, and then you extract also the high and low pH chemical shifts. And that's given by this equation. The chemical shift is a function of those three parameters. And then from that point on, you can actually use the chemical shift of the midazole to tell you what the pH of the solution is in the NMR spectrometer. And so once you know the chemical shifts, uh, upfield and downfield, and you know the pKa, you put in the chemical shift and you calculate the pKa. And so, to cover the entire pH range of 1 to 12, you have to use multiple um, NMR pH indicators. So these are the indicators we use, and that allows us to calculate the chemical shift, or sorry, calculate the pH from the chemical shifts of these indicators when you use them in the range that's maybe plus or minus one and a half points around their individual pKa. So that's why you need multiple indicators to cover the entire pH range. So the other thing that you have to do uh, in order to measure with NMR the pKa of ionizable lipids is to create water-soluble analogs. Uh, reason being is these ionizable lipids in, uh, in a, a solvent, a water solvent, will simply precipitate. The NMR lines become too broad to analyze. So we use water-soluble synthetically uh, created uh, analogs of these head groups. And then, for example, the MC3 terbutyl water soluble analog, we put in the spectrometer at different pHs, and those pHs are actually calculated from the chemical shift of these two NMR indicators, imidazole and piperazine. And then you can calculate the pH and put that on the x axis and put the chemical shift of MC3 on the y axis and fit that to Henderson Hasselbalch. And you can measure by NMR the pKa of the head group of MC3, which came out to be 9.45, and it's very close to the pKa that's predicted by uh, ACD Labs Percepta. And so these are the, the four fits. Um, Dogma and, uh, and DLIN are actually the same head groups. So we only see four for the five ionizable lipids. And what you find is that the NMR measurement pretty well agrees to a very high accuracy with the prediction of either the classic or the GLASS algorithm in ACD lab. So to conclude, we know that the prediction for these monoprotic head groups is accurate. It really is the pKa of the ionizable lipid head group, and it is um, about two to three points higher than the pKa of TNS. So we looked around for an explanation of this phenomena. What we found is that the issue is when you're measuring TNS, your pH electrode is in the water, you actually don't have access to the pH in the LNP where the ionization is occurring. And so there's an a equilibrium of protons between the lipid phase and the aqueous phase. And if you write that out thermodynamically, you'll find that the apparent pKa that you're measuring is the intrinsic pKa in the lipid with a couple of correction terms. The first one being the proton partitioning correction term. So the energy of solvation, protons love to be in water. They don't want to be in lipid. And so this is energetically costly to put them in there. And so basically the pH is about three points higher in the LNP than it is in the water outside the LNP. And then this term is a term that, that is dependent on the electrostatic potential of the nanoparticle. And so when it's positive, it'll reject protons and make the pKa lower and more acidic. If it's negative, it'll attract protons and make the pKa more basic and higher. So that's a um, uh, ionization state dependent term that affects the pKa as well. But the basic effect of what we're seeing is that um, the proton partitioning favors the aqueous phase. And so there's essentially a pH difference between the aqueous phase and the lipid phase. The advantage of this model 
in addition to explaining that two to three point difference, um, the advantage is if you're looking at designing ionizable lipids using this approach, you, you can determine if at least the PKA parameter is going to be correct by theoretically calculating it, knowing what that correction term is, and being certain that that effective PK in the LNP is going to be six to seven. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother making the LNP. So then, of course, we, we made the LNPs and we analyzed, and this is the work of two graduate students, Manuel Carrasco and Lacey Wright, and analyzing by TNS that everyone has done for a very long time. TNS, negative um, aromatic compound that enhances its fluorescence upon binding a positively charged lipid interface. And that binding is enhanced, of course, when the lipid is more positive at lower pH. So this provides basically a measurement of LNP surface potential. It's not the net charge, but it's the charge at the surface. And you see here that it, it will increase fluorescence down to about a pH of six. And then generally it stops, except for DODAP, that is a very low pK. So it's not sensitive to changes below a pH of six and measures surface potential. So we also wanted to measure net potential or net electric charge. We did that with electrophoretic mobility and zeta potential. People are very familiar with this. The only thing is to be sure that you set manually the voltage lower than the automatic setting so that you don't fry the LNPs and also work in a bit of a low ionic strength media to minimize ohmic heating as well. And then the zeta potential at the surface can be measured. And here I'm showing you for all five LNP superposed. And you notice maybe that the titration curve is kind of stretched. It's not as abrupt as it is for uh, typical Henderson Hasselbeck curves. It's over four pH units rather than two. And that's due to that electrostatic correction term. It's a, the pK actually changes as you ionize the LNP. Um, and the other thing that you get out of um, the zeta potential is you get a pKa from the zeta potential, but you also get a pi, the isoelectric point. So the point at which the pH where you have neutral charge is picked up by the zeta potential that you don't have access to with um, TNS. And of course, you see the ionization all the way through the endosomal pH range. So it's a way of assessing endosomal protonation that otherwise you don't have access to. So fitting the extended henderson hasselbeck you find another kind of pKa, which is a zeta potential pKa, and then you can find a pI, the isoelectric point of the LNP. And notice here how the pI of KC2 is much higher than that of MC3. This means that MC3 is a much more negative LNP than KC2, shown here by the purple line. Um, so we measured also the, the cryotin morphology. Here you see typical morphology for KC2, MC3. We see irregular heterogeneous structures for DLIN. Uh, we saw, oddly enough and unexpected, a small liposomal population for dogma that was quite present. And for DODAP, we see these mRNA-containing multi-compartmental structures as well. So the morphology we find also is important to understand how in vitro transfection works. We surprisingly found KC2 to be the most potent in vitro transfection agent for 293 cells, and MC3 was second and then down the stream. Of course, DODAP didn't work at all because its PKA was too low in spite of these uh, structures here, which are thought to be potent structures, but not always. And DOGMA was also not very potent, probably because there was a lot of particles that were simply empty that were taken up by the cells. And then DLIN had a lot of heterogeneous structures that also, uh, in spite of it having the right kind of PKA, uh, was not as potent as MC3 or KC2. And surprisingly, KC2 was the most potent. And if you look at the PI, that may explain what's going on here. Since generally in vitro, positively charged particles are better transfection agents than negative. And MC3 is more negative. So in vitro, uh, KC2 is more uh, potent than MC3. Then when we look in IM and IV injections using IVIS, what we found is that KC2 was also more potent in IM injections, um, maybe 50%, sometimes two times higher than MC3 if you do the ROI over the injection site. Um, they all leak to, to liver to a certain extent, but MC3 is more potent in intravascular. So what that kind of suggests here is maybe like in vitro that the positive charge of KC2 is helping possibly to retain and, and accentuate uh, expression locally uh, and perhaps limit, um, uh, I guess, uh, passing through the muscle spaces and finding vasculature and then targeting uh, the liver, which is what uh, MC3 uh, does. <clears throat>
And you can sort of see one thing I think I mentioned before, and, and one reason that uh, KC2 may be more potent here is it's less negatively charged than MC3. So what we did is we made KC2 more negatively charged. We did that like Krantz did. We modulated the NP ratio. So by having an excess of ionizable lipid, very high NP of eight, you make a very positive LNP. And as you reduce the NP ratio, it becomes less positive. And you see a, a huge change in the isoelectric pH. So at NP8, the isoelectric pH is about seven. At NP2, the isoelectric pH is five and a half. So at two, it's a much more negatively charged particle at, uh, at neutral pH than at the higher NP ratios. And so what we see is when we inject these low NP particles, they're actually more potent in the intramuscular site, but they also, this is the ratio of the flux in the liver to the intramuscular injection site. And you see you have as much expression in the liver at the low NP ratios as you do at the injection site. So the low NP, the more negative particle facilitates leakage to vasculature and eventual expression in hepatocytes, which is off target, undesirable expression. So just to uh, summarize, we looked at what some of the determinants are of, of the delivery efficiency of mRNA by these LNPs. The familiar PK of six to seven uh, was needed, and we related that to the um, aqueous phase PK of the ionizable lipid. There's a, a very consistent relationship there. Um, so DODAP violated that and was not effective. But we also found that these other two um, ionizable lipids, Dodman and DLIN, uh, you had to really account for the morphology resulting from self-assembly to understand their potency. And then we found KC2 to be more potent than MC3, both in 293s in vitro and then in intramuscular, but MC3 to maintain its superiority in intravascular hepatocyte targeting. And we hypothesized that that's a charge-mediated effect with uh, MC3 being a more negative LNP. And these more negative LNPs, we find consistently in all sorts of different contexts that they, in the intramuscular site, leak out go to vasculature and express more highly in uh, the liver in off-target undesirable expression. And so everything I showed you here is in revision of coming out soon uh, in, in communication biology. And my collaborator, I'd just like to thank Michael Page, synthetic uh, chemistry who made the water-soluble analogs through Wiseman Mohamed Alame who um, made the mRNAs and helped interpret our in vivo data, and then the cryo-10 imaging done by Tom Cleveland and Alex Grishev at NIST. Thank you very much. I think there's some time for questions now. Well, thank you. So we'll have to wrap up there. So uh, thank you very much. We're at the top of the hour. Thanks very much for that really interesting and uh, fascinating talk. I certainly uh, very much enjoyed it. Um, and uh, thanks very much to our audience for joining and uh, interacting as well. If you did um, ask a question and uh, we haven't been able to answer it during the live session, we will follow up and get back to you. So uh, all that remains um, is for me to say thanks very much, certainly as someone who uh, recently received an uh, intramuscular injection of LNPs. Um, I found that uh, very interesting and uh, enlightening. Um, and uh, we look forward Forward to seeing everyone again in a month's time uh, for the uh, the next tea time webinar. So so thank you thank you very much everyone. All right, my pleasure. Thank you.